first of all, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, welcome to this Factor webinar. When, when Factor decided to organize a monthly webinar a few months ago, our aim was actually to cover a vast range of different topics, all of them somehow linked with animal traction and working equids. And the truth is that from nutrition to equid behavior to how to training a young horse, we, we somehow cover some of these topics. But today uh, we are going to have a different approach and we're going to talk about sustainability. And for that, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Roger Cutting. Roger, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, let me just... I'll just make a small step here to accept three more participants. Uh, Roger is our education leader at the Dunkin' Sanctuary, and he's also a visiting research fellow for the University of Plymouth. Uh, Roger, before joining the Dunkin' Sanctuary, he worked as, a, as an associate professor in environmental education at the University of Plymouth, and a research fellow at the Center of, for Sustainable Futures, and subsequently the Sustainable Earth Institute, both recognized as national centers of excellence in sustainability. Prior to this, he carried out research at the Rural Techno Technology Unit at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And today, Roger will cover the topic, thinking but not learning, issues around concept concepts of sustainability illustrated through the example of working animals. Roger, thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you for the introduction, Joe. Yeah, I, I didn't recognize myself, really. Um, <laughs> as I was saying earlier, it's frightening how, uh, how old I've got. Um, you know, it's it's, a, it's quite a long and varied career, um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm good. I, I I feel very unqualified to talk to you as a as a as a, as a group of professionals because um, I, I I'm not a horse expert, um, even though I work or I'm even a donkey expert. I've, I've uh, even though I work for the donkey sanctuary, I'm not too sure about these these things with four legs. So um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the the problems of concepts around sustainability. Um, uh, and in, in relation to um, sustainable living. And then I'm going to look at some case examples of what um, sustainable communities might look like and, and the requirements they have for working animals. And then I'm just going to finish off by talking about some of the problems that we, we, we might have um, relating to uh, the future, you know, the, the, the sustainable development goals and our our action or inaction uh, relative to those uh, relative to those goals. So it's going to be it's going to be a bit of a it's going to be a bit of a journey. I'm going to take you on, all right? Um, and it's going to it's uh, hopefully you'll get something out of it. If you've got any questions, don't don't hesitate to ask as I go along. Um, it's far better to do that, um, or you know we'll, we can have a, a a chat at the end. But um, I'm just going to go for a bit of a as I said, we're going to go for a bit of a, a wander around the the world, the wonderful world of sustainability. Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now, um, if I can find it. That's the one. Okay, and uh, when that goes away, I can get up here somewhere, and I shall uh, endeavour to. Uh, uh, I can't get. I can't get underneath this thing for the moment. You can go yeah. to the bottom right, next to the size of this the, the that slide. One? That one. Yep. Okay, so as Joao said, I'm I, I, I'm a uh, I was an associate professor at the University of Plymouth uh, in environmental education for about fifteen years, and I still am a visiting research fellow there. Um, but I also work for the Donkey Sanctuary, and um, both organisations have have templates for PowerPoint presentations, and you can see that they're, they're they're distinctly different because the University of Plymouth has a blue line at the bottom, and the Donkey Sanctuary has a green line at the side. So I didn't know which one to use because I didn't want to upset either of the organizations. So I've decided to go neutral. So my slides don't have any background to them at all. Um, and I'll just be talking to, to the pictures as we, as, as we go along. I'm going to talk about thinking, but not learning. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully explain what I mean by that um, by, the time, by the time we get to the end of the presentation. Um, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an important concept that I think uh, I'd like everyone to sort of think about as we as, as we go through. Um, so um, I'm going to start off by asking about sustainability, talking about sustainability. And I quite I quite like this picture uh, of this road um, with sustainability um, because I can't imagine anything less sustainable than an asphalt road that's dead straight and just blasting through the environment like that. That's uh, that's a really um, Kind of contradictory picture really 
um, you know, oil-based material to build roads to move, um, you know, petrol-driven cars and, and lorries on. Um, and, and we call that sustainability. And I think it, 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 I, lo I quite like it as an image because it, I think it throws up some of the contradictions around concepts of sustainability. And the book to the right hand side, um, sustainable educate, or Sustainability Education, was a book that's, that was edited by uh, Paula Jones and uh, Dave Sterling and Steve, uh, sorry, Dave Selby and, and Steve Sterling a few years ago. Um, and in that book, um, I, I wrote a chapter in that book. It's by, it's by far the best chapter, by the way. Um, it's, uh, uh, in that book, David, David Selby talks about the, the, the difficult, shaky road to sustainability. He, he, likens, he likens going to a sustainable world or moving towards a sustainable world like a, like a difficult journey. And that's the, that's the metaphor I want to use in this presentation. I want to think about the journey we're going to go on to achieve sustainability. All right. So first of all, let's have a think about what what we actually mean by the term sustainability and i'm sure you're you're familiar with the person on the left hand side here this is uh Gro harlem brundtland um she was the chair of the of the commission um of 19, uh, 1987 that was the first commission really un commission to come up with the with the brundtland definition of what the, uh, of what sustainability is and it's that intergenerational thing that we that we need to in our, our paraphrase here but we we have to meet the needs of the present by not detrimentally, detrimentally affecting the needs of future generations, which kind of presupposes we need we know what those, those needs of future generations are going to be. But that's the first kind of hard definition that we have of sustainability in, in, in 1987, so 35 years ago. The, the guy on the right, um, you may not know, um, his name is Jonathan Porritt. Um, he's a he's a um, environmental author. He's a British environmental author, and he was the first person really to be critical of the concept of sustainable development. Um, he said, you know, he said it's uh, it's what we, what you call an oxymoron. It's a it's a um, it's two words that contradict each other. You can't have sustainable development. He, he likened it famously or infamously. He likened sustainable you know the concept of sustainable development as the logic of the cancer cell. You know, you just cannot keep on and on growing. You, you can't keep developing, you, know, you have to reach a point of zero growth. So even from the very onset of the definition of sustainability, the, it's been a contested term. Um, and if we go even further, we can go into a whole range of different approaches and ideas around concepts of sustainability. So in the top right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this is, this is, this is a very elderly James Lovelock, who's still around. Um, and James Lovelock, of the, famously for the, uh, the you know, Gaia, uh, uh, Gaia theory now, um, he argued that sustainability is all about ecology. It's about the natural environment, about the living world around us. We have to keep the planet sustainable. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the life forms on the planet need to be maintained as a, as a living organism. And then we have uh, Gregory Bateson, who famously wrote a very difficult book to read. Um, that steps to the ecological mind. And Bateson said, uh, he's, he was saying it's not just about the living world, it's about the connections between humans and the living world. We're all connected together as, as, as one living entity. He didn't go as far as, as, as Lovelock and say that the world is a living entity, um, but, he has, but he talks a lot about the connections and the relationship between people and the, and the, and the living world, about, the, you know, about humans and the living world. On the other hand, we have Molly Cato at the, the bottom left there. And Molly Cato is part of the, uh, the, the New Economics Foundation. And she argues very strongly that actually sustainability is about economic sustainability. You know, we need, we need to develop sustainable economic systems. You know, we need to move away from linear, linear production lines where we dig something out of the ground, we process it, we use it, we throw it away. We need to go to circular production lines. So she sees sustainability very much as an economic approach. And then, of course, we've got uh, got uh, E.F. Schumacher, um, who in the 1970s was 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 arguing that a, a sustainable world, a future world, had to be um, was all, was all about social organisation, was all about decentralising, small, you know, low tech approaches, low tech paths to the future, was the, was what we should be going down. So some people argue that sustainability is about improving technology. Some people say it's about ecology. 
Some say it's about our relationship with the, with the environment. Some people say it's economic. It's used in a whole variety of different ways. So we have different interpretations of what it means, but we also have different ideas of what color it should be. <laughs> I'll explain with this slide. Okay. Uh, these are two major thinkers of the 20th century when it comes to um, sustainability. Uh, the guy on the right hand side, as you look at the screen, some of you may know, is, is Arne Neus, the, the Norwegian philosopher, and he's the father of, of, of deep ecology. Right? And uh, deep ecology is the idea that um, it's a very, very, you know, very deep green kind of um, environmentalism, that, that we are innately connected to the environment, you know, and we, and we have this very, very deep relationship with all living things. Um, Nea has spent a lot of time on a, on a living in a living on the side of a mountain on his own in, in Norway, deeply immersed in nature. Um, you know, a very kind of um, um, Walden Pond sort of uh, 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 approach to to ecology. And he said it's all about relationships. It's all about our our connection. We have to forget about the rational and connect to nature and nature on the emotional level. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional relationship we have, and without that emotional relationship, we, we will continue to destroy the environment. Right. Um, the guy on the left there, some of you may know, is what he actually says, is Murray Bookchin. And Murray Bookchin absolutely hated uh, deep ecology. Um, he called it, he, he coined the phrase eco la la. He said it's, 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 it's all tree hugging, it's nothing, it's, it's, nothing. it's, 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 not, it's, it's artificial. Um, and uh, Murray Bookchin said it's not about relationships, it's not about emotional relationships with the world around us, it's about political structures. And Bookchin was a Marxist and he said we will not be able to um, save the planet until we abandon capitalism. You know, and, and that was that's the whole idea of, of, of social ecology, that it's not about relationships at all, it's about political change, about radical political change. So we don't really have a hard idea of what sustainability is in terms of definitions. And we don't know whether it's green or it's red. You know, it's, it's uh, and, and if it is green, what sort of shade of green? Is it deep green? Is it light green? Are we sustainable enough yet? Or, or do we need to change, you know, do we really need a, a Marxist revolution or can we, or, or, or just socialism do? Or social democracy, how about that, you know? Okay, so we don't know what color it is and we don't know what it looks like. So that's a that's a tricky that's a tricky thing to sort of um, to uh, to kick off with. So we will look for clarity, shall we, um, in definitions, and we'll look for clarity by um, going forward to look at what the United Nations says of what sustainability is. And this is this is this will be reassuring to many of you, because in the top left hand corner we have the, the three pillars of sustainability, which some of you will, I'm sure are very familiar with. Oh, hang on, what's, what's there on the top right? Oh, it's, it's the four circles of sustainability. And hang on, what's that, what's that in the bottom left? Oh, it's the five realms of sustainability. <laughs> and, uh, and there's the five themes of sustainability. And there are the 17 sustainable development goals. Right? Even the United Nations um, publishes rather ambiguous material about what sustainability actually is. It, it doesn't seem to be able to define it right. and then finally for this section um, some people are arguing that we should just abandon it altogether you know um, it's, it's, it's been around for 35 years we still don't understand what it is let's kick it into touch and and and, and we'll go down another path we'll, we'll we'll have another term how about resilience that will do right so we'll replace sustainability with resilience whatever resilience means right. so the, the point I'm, I'm, I've, I've laboured quite significantly here is that we don't quite understand what sustainability is and how it functions, but that's okay. That's all right. Uh, if you know anything about systems theory and systems approaches, you'll know we, that we that you'll know of the concept of the black box. A black box is something that you know something's happening, but you're not too sure what it is. You can put it into a black box and just ignore it for a while. So we'll stick this in a black box for a while. We'll just put that aside. We, so we'll, we'll just we'll just say well, we don't really understand. We know sustainability is something. We're not sure what it is. We'll just put it in a in a black box. Let's move on on our journey right, and see if it can be achieved. 
Right, so this, um, you may have come across this before. This is the, the Earth overshoot day, right? Um, this is the data since 1970. So this is the, the period of time, the time of year, where the Earth overshoots its resources. We're using more resources than are actually available, so we're, so we're not being sustainable. And you can see that the Brunton report was in 87, which is that column there. And we've done really well since then. <laughs> Right. Um, even with the uh, the beginning of the uh, of the whole concepts of sustainability, the overshoot days come further and further and closer and closer to us into into July. Right. So by by July now, you can see just at the end there, it's gone back up again. That's due to COVID. Uh, COVID nineteen has given the Earth a bit of a breather, um, but all the indications are that it will go back down again next year in two thousand and twenty two. We're ever consuming more and more of the Earth's resources. We're already, at this rate, consuming the resources of 1.6 planets, right, compared to where we were in 1970. Right. And if we go on to the next slide, um, this is by, this is, um, this is an overshoot day by, by, um, by country. And you can see, hopefully here, I don't, can you see my cursor? Can you move it, Roger? Yeah, yes, maybe. yes, is there, yep. Okay, yeah, you can see here, um, this is the United States, North America, Canada and the United States, this is for, this is for Stacey. And you can see that the Earth overshoot, or sorry, the, the, the overshoot day for the US and for Canada is the 14th of March. That's the point at which those countries have used their allocation of the Earth's resources. After that, they're using everybody else's. So for everyone to live, like the average Canadian or American citizen, you've used up your resources in about three months. You've got another nine months to go. So it would take about four planet Earths for everybody to live in the same way that North Americans do. Okay, if we come down to um, Europe, you can come down this area here. Um, the Europeans are down here. Um, you can see, uh, I think uh, there's, there's the UK. Uh, we're doing better than Portugal, Joel. Um, I, don't know, I, don't know what, I don't know what Portugal's doing back up there, but, but most of the European countries are in about May sometime. Okay. So, which implies that for everybody to live like the average European, we would need two and a half planet Earths of, of resources. Right. That's physically impossible. Right. We will never, ever reach a situation where everybody lives or has on the planet has the same living standards as the average European does. Now I know you can argue, well, resource development is a, it's a faint, strange thing. It can, it can sometimes accelerate, it can sometimes slow down. But the point is that we're living on borrowed time. And even, I mean, the, one, of the, one of the problems with this graph is that many of the African countries are missing, but you can see even to get to, get to sort of this area here, where we would be living at one world levels of consumption, We've got to live like Ecuadorians or Indonesians, no, no, no offense to anybody from Ecuador or Indonesia, but you can see that we've got to begin to really seriously consider a resource allocation, which would be the same as a low income country for the whole planet. Okay. Just to achieve a, a one world level of uh, one world levels of consumption, it would require effectively and I think the coronavirus last year reduced the UK's GDP by about 10%. The crash of 2008 reduced it by 3%. Both were really been really, really profound. You know, the United Kingdom now is broke as a country. We're in more debt than we earn, right? Um, that's 10%. To, to, to achieve this would take a 60% reduction in GDP. That should be a profound change, revolutionary change to the way we live in Europe and, and, uh, um, and uh, in North America. Phenomenal changes. So we have to ask ourselves, is it achievable? Is it, can we live comfortably? Can we live sustainably? So we're not too sure what it is and it might not even be able to be achieved. So let's move on to the next stage of the journey, which is to think about what does a sustainable world look like? Okay, and this is some. This is a little bit of research we did at the university a few years ago, 
Um, these, these, these look like children's drawings. They're actually done by 20 year olds. Right? This is, this, this is the, I don't know what's happening to art education these days, but it's appalling in, in Britain, as you can see. Um, we, 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 we used to ask the students to draw what they thought a sustainable community would look like, or a, one, you know, a community that was at one world levels of consumption would look like. And this is pretty ubiquitous, but I chose these two pictures because they're pretty much um, sum, sum up some, some of the main themes that students used to identify. First and foremost, virtually every picture had a wind turbine in it or some form of alternative green energy, like a water wheel or, or a wind turbine or solar panels. Um, they had things like, you know, areas for growing food. They were virtually all rural. We did this with well over 150 students, and only two ever drew cities. Um, and little eco houses, you know, designed houses and things. And have a think, have a, have a, have a think for a minute while I, while I sip my coffee, have a think what you think a, a village or a community that lives at one world levels of consumption in the developed world might look like. Because now I'll show you. <laughs> right. Um, this is a this is a, a community um, in Devon, where I near, near where I live. And these are the, these are we worked with four communities like this when I was working at the university. And this is a group of people that have come together. Um, they're called low impact communities, and they come together and they buy an area of land. They buy normally a woodland, and then they move into it. They they pull their resources together and they move into the wood, and then they apply for permission to stay, which they normally get for five years, and then they can apply again after five years. They're not allowed to build any permanent dwellings. Right? And the four communities that we work with, there's about 24 of them in England, 24 low impact communities. These aren't just communes or um, alternative communities. There's lots of different types. Right? Some people buy houses, some people buy farms or small holdings. These people live off grid. So there's no electricity, and there's no running water and there's no there's no drainage there's no, no there's no running toilet you know um, mains drainage right so they're, they're, they're entire they're entirely off grid right and they live as far as they can and, and they're independently assessed each year they live at one world levels of consumption so these young people are living at the level that everybody on the planet could live at and this is this is what it looks like OK, now they look a bit ropey from the outside because these are called the, the buildings are called benders. And the reason they're called benders is they're made out of bent hazel. They, they cut hazel trees, hazel bends very nicely, and then it's then it hardens up over time. And that's the that's the internal structure. And then they're insulated with um, with cotton filled, uh, what we call eider downs or co cotton filled material. And then these are tarpaulins, ex British Army tarpaulins that they put over the top. Right? They look a bit ropey from the outside. Um, but inside, this is, this is what they look like inside. That, that lower one, the one at the bottom of the picture, that's the guest house. That's where I, that's where I, that's where I lived. Right? And the, the, the picture on the right hand side is the interior of the guest house. And that one on the left hand side, someone else's house. But you can see the interior structure. And this is how these, these young people live. Um, as I said, they live in one world level, level consumption. They don't argue that they're sustainable. Um, but they are trying to live much more lightly on the planet. Uh, they, they're stepping lightly on the planet, really. They're trying to use fewer and fewer resources and recycle as much as they can. Right? And that's, the, that's what the, um, the Land Matters community looks like. So the point I'm saying is that, is that there's quite a big difference between what you might have envisaged a one world sustainable community might look like and what in the development, in a high income country at least, what they actually look like. So my, my contention is that we don't know what sustainability is. We're not sure if we can achieve it. And we wouldn't recognize it when we get there because we, we don't know what it looks like. We're gonna be like kids in the back of a car going on a trip saying, are we nearly there yet? You know, are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there yet? You know, how, are we sustainable enough yet? Or do we have to be more sustainable? Right? So we don't, we don't really seem to know where we're going. And the final point on this is this this, 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 the, this is the conclusion for the first bit of the talk this evening. The final point is this is this diagram from Jules Petty's paper that came out this year, 2021. And you may have seen this diagram before, this, this diagram before. It's a bit dated now, actually, but this is um, up the side here. We've got average happiness, um, 
this was very popular in um, uh, the UK a few a few years back. Out one of our prime ministers, we get, we get through prime ministers pretty quickly these days in Britain. Um, but I think the prime minister before the last one uh, was very keen on, on, on engaging happiness. Um, so this is this is a this is a happiness scale of one to ten. Ten is you're ecstatically happy. You know, one is you're miserable. And along the along the x-axis is the is the GDP per capita. Or you could you could equate that to something like carbon emissions if you wanted to. Um, and you can see that it doesn't actually take much of an increase here to see significant increases in happiness. Right? So small increases from very low levels of, of, of GDP, that no levels of GDP makes people a lot happy. So, so from starvation to not starving, unsurprisingly, makes people very happy. Right? Um, but always been as a, as a as a as a environmental scientist i've always been much more interested in the outlying data i'm quite interested in this stuff up here actually these ones over here because even though it levels off the, inf the infection points about here somewhere but even though it levels off you can see that actually um the more the gdp the happier we are right not much more but but there's the trend so just to recap we don't know what sustainability is we don't know whether it's achievable we don't know what it looks like we won't recognize when we get there but we do know we're going to be less happy so that's that's a real sales pitch there for sustainability isn't it i mean do we really want to go on this journey i mean it sounds it sounds dreadful <laughs> And, and how how are we going to navigate when we don't know when we don't know where we're going? Okay, so that kind of um, that's that's the uh, that's my end of the first bit of the talk. Is everybody, is everybody okay with that so far? Is that right, Joel? Yep, yep. Go for it, Roger. Because now I'm going to go on. I know your I know your um, animal uh, people and and uh, working animals. Don't worry, they're coming. I just, I just wanted to get that into the uh, into the mix first of all. Yeah. Um, so, what we did a few years ago was at the universities we decided to um, work with these with these communities. Um, uh, it struck me that a lot of people. Uh, this is the Stewards Wood community. This is um, in Devon as well. This is one we work very very closely with, and um, it struck me that that they had a reputation of being sort of hippies in the wood you know, um, living in the woods and no one really knew what they were doing there. And, and it struck me that actually that, that, that they were on a really, really steep learning curve. And if someone said to me, you go, go over into that wood and create a sustainable community, create a, a, a low impact community, I, I, I wouldn't know where to start and, and, and neither did they. So we thought what we're trying to do was, would be legitimize what they were doing. And talk to them really closely and carefully about what they were learning about trying to live in one world levels of consumption in the, I don't know what, the seventh, eighth biggest economy in the world. So these are people trying to live in one world levels of consumption in a high income country. Okay, and this is, this is the Stewards Wood community. And you can see these are, the, these are their, their dwellings, these are the houses that they live in. Um, this this one in the top right corner. I uh, don't know if you. I can't see my, my my cursor moving around. I'm afraid. But the one in the top right hand corner. That's the communal kitchen and the guest house. And these are the the the, uh, the house in the middle. Top top middle um, is a guy called Merlin's house. Uh, the 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 platform here, that platform there. Um, that's actually the stage from. If you're if you're familiar with the Glastonbury Festival, um, that's the stage from Glastonbury. Um, Michael Evis, who owns the farm that Glastonbury takes place on, um, donated the stage to them. So uh, Merlin's always very chuffed that Coldplay um, played on <laughs> played on that stage. <laughs> so uh, that's the one claim. Uh, these are these are somebody else's houses. You see, largely recycled materials. Uh, this guy called John. It's John's house in the, in the. That's me intensely talking to him. Um, there's there's John's house in the background there. These are the guys working in the woods. They they obviously utilize a lot of the wood and you can see that a great deal of the timber is cut from the wood and, and, and there's an awful lot of transport and, and movement of materials around the site how do they do that well you'd be glad to know 
the, the major um, uh, kind of energy inputs into these low, these low impact communities that we were working with was animal power. And this is um, here, but this, this is actually, sorry about this, it's a bit pixel this, this one, we're standing quite a long way away. This is, um, uh, this is a private contractor they brought in actually, whoops, sorry, come, come, come too forward. This is a private contractor they brought in, um, or they use their own horses to move the material around. Um, this is the this is um, uh, this one on the top right here. This is Owen. Um, Owen's lived on communes and, commu and lived in communities, alternative communities, for very very many years since the 1960s. And this is and this is Khan, the horse they have at uh, Stewart's Wood. And uh, they even, as you can see, the bottom right there. They um, if you can if you can um, see that picture, they even they even take Khan to the pub with them. Right. So they 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 take the horse into the pub, um, and all the locals love him and. Uh, but it's a really it's a really important relationship and it's the major it's a major source of power when we took students to these places remember those pictures we got them to draw and they always they always drew wind turbines um actually these communities don't need electricity their their electricity demands are very very low they don't they don't have wind turbines they have some solar panels which allow for led lights in in the houses low low energy lights in the houses but that's that's about it. That's all that that's all they they want the energy for. The the main source of power is, is are other animals, um, and that's a, that's an important part of the learning process from from these communities. So that's that's the Stewards Wood community uh, near Morton Hampstead in, in in Devon. For anybody from the UK, this is just near Dartmoor National Park. Um, this one is Tinker's Bubble, and Tinker's Bubble is in Somerset, just across the border. This is quite a well-established uh, uh, community now. It's been there for a few decades now, actually. And you can see better, better quality temporary houses under under their planning regulations. They're only allowed to build temporary temporary structures, right? Um, and you can see this this one in the bottom, the centre bottom picture is the is the guest house. That's where you'd stay if you went to uh, if you went to work at Tinker's Bubble. Um, and the roundhouse to the bottom left there is that's their that's their central meeting place. And these are these are the houses they built again. Groups of young people, and once more, they're living at one world levels of consumption. And one of the important aspects of their lifestyle is the animal traction. Right, and the horses are used. This is their this is their orchard, um, top top left there. They're using the horse there for, for as you can obviously see for ploughing. And on the right hand side, uh, the horse here. Um, you can see that that big that big wheel there. Um, this this horse is helping make cider. Um, they they pull that rope and the apples fall into a, a circular trough, and the horse takes the takes the rolling stone round and crushes the apples, and they get the apple juice and ferment it and make cider, which they then drink, uh, and they sell in the local the local markets as well as a, as an additional income. Now. It's quite easy to be critical and say, "Well, hang on, you know, this is not really truly sustainable." They're using the trappings of um, of, of, a, of a, an unsustainable world in terms of the carts, in terms of the of, in terms of harness, but they're but they're making an effort. They're trying. They're trying to live in a different way. And um, I thought, as you, uh, you you might want a break now, so I've got some really 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 poor videos of of horses moving. <laughs> which I'll show you as, as a, a bit like a, a bit like a break. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> and then there's this, I thought, you see the horse going forward? Let's see a horse going backwards. Okay, so I thought you'd just like to see those, really, as as, as I said, as your uh, as your working working animal people. Um, there's some shots of horses, and it, I, I like I like the last one with the, where the horse is going backwards because you can actually get an idea of what the community look like, looks like and feels like, how quiet it is, how peaceful it is, and how deep in the woods it is as well. These a lot of these communities tend to be pretty low under the radar, really, for uh, quite obvious reasons. And then finally, if you're wondering how they 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 plank the material up. Um, to build the houses. I've got two more interesting videos to show you. This, this isn't about animal power, but it's an alternative form of power. 
They've got a steam engine. They burn, they burn wood um, to drive the steam engine. You can see there's a massive great flywheel on the side. There's a drive belt that comes down to the circular saw. And this is what they do with the circular saw. Sorry, stop, stop, stop. That's it. Um, I just thought you'd like to see that because that's when I filmed that. It's one of the most frightening things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's, it's the, the no, there's no health and safety regulations at all here. I, I thought the steam engine was going to blow up, and I thought the uh, I thought that tree was just going to get thrown off the saw bed, really. But um, but that's how, that's how they do it anyway. So they use they use they don't use they try not to use any kind of uh, fossil fuels, any kind of they obviously need oil for. The steam engine, but they 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 stew that. They use animals and wood fuel um, for their for their major power sources in these uh, in these communities. So that's the. Um, are we doing for time? Oh, blimey! Let's speed up. That's the um, that's the that, that's the bit of uh, around about um, um, uh, alternative communities. Just to finish that off, um, you can see. I don't, I don't know if you remember the Occupy movement of a few years ago. Uh, um, some of you might might be familiar with the Occupy movement. Uh, we did some work with 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 uh, young people in the Occupy movement as well. And you can see this is this was actually in London. This is the tent university. Um, the young people occupied built the um, the tent city outside uh, St Paul's Cathedral in London. Also built themselves a university um, or a learning centre so they could learn from each other about about sustainability. So there's a real there's a real drive to understand and to think about the future, which is perhaps expressing itself more with um, organisations like Extinction Rebellion today. But with those people in the low impact communities, one of the things that we we came across was that they, they had come, when we asked them about sustainability, what they thought sustainability was, one thing came back and back, and that's that sustainability is about functional relationships. This is what they, this is what they'd learned. And I'm sorry that the the bottom right hand photo is a bit blurred, but we were drinking quite a bit of cider that night. Um, and I think I, I think I was losing the control of my right hand. Um, but it's about human relationships. It's about how well communities can come together and, and work together. But it's also about the relationships with, with the animals around them as well, about the natural environment, and but particularly those, those working animals. So working animals are really, really important in in sustainability uh, and i think this is this yeah for, for people trying to live in one world conditions in the, the in a high income country working animals are still really important for them to achieve those aims and then i'm going to move on completely now this is ladakh this is in northern kashmir in india and this is a story that my my one of my best friends a guy called bob cook who i used to work at the university used to tell about research he did in, in Ladakh in, in Kashmir. Bob went out and lived with a uh, lived in a village, lived with a with a with a in a village that lived in traditional ways in, in Ladakh for a year. And it was a bit of um, what we'd call kind of um, sort of you know immersive research, a sort of bit of phenomenology really. And um, he wrote up his experiences. And at the end of his time there, at the end of the year, there was a path that went down to the river that people used to go down to collect water from. And the path was really muddy and Bob had a few days left before he flew back to the UK. And there were lots of slabs of stone lying around. So he built steps down to the river and, and a little area where they could stand to fill their, their uh, water containers up with. And the villagers were ever so, were ever so grateful to him. They said, oh, that's great, it's wonderful, it's brilliant. And Bob came back to the UK, didn't think anything more and then about uh, eight, nine months later, he went back out to follow up, to do some follow up research. He was only there for a couple of months, but he went back to the village and the path and the steps had all fallen into disrepair. 
And he said to one of the people in the village, and the villagers were, were walking round the steps down, they'd formed a path down to the river next to where the steps had been. And Bob said to somebody from the village, why didn't you repair the steps? And the person said, well, it's all right, we can, we can get down to the river by, by the path next to the steps. And he said, yeah, but your, your, your feet get really muddy. And the guy said, yeah, but we can wash our feet. And Bob at that point realized that he'd learned an awful lot, but he hadn't been listening. And that's where the title of this presentation comes from. I've stolen it from my, my colleague, Bob at the University of Plymouth, who used to talk a lot about how we don't understand problems until we listen to, until we listen to them. And this in part is the idea of this kind of top down. If, we, if we're looking at top down tech solutions and we don't understand the problem, we don't understand what sustainability is, we're never going to find any solutions. Even if we look to the UN, these are two reports that have come out in the last sort of, uh, five, six, seven years, reviewing the sustainable development goals. The one on the right, making every drop count, is the agenda for water. It doesn't mention animals at all. How many villages in East Africa, how many people living in low impact, uh, low, uh, low income countries require animals to collect water? And yet they're not mentioned in the review of the sustainable development goals. Looking at the sustainable transport review on the left hand side, you don't even have to open that. All you've got to do is look at the picture on the front cover to get an idea of what the United Nations thinks sustainable transport looks like. Again, not a single mention of, of working animals. There's, there's, something, there's something going awry there, there's something missing. And then finally, and I'll, I'll come to an end now, finally, that's, that's me there when I was about five years old um, in, in the bottom left-hand corner. These are, these are the two universities I've worked for. The top left university is the University of East Anglia that, that Joel mentioned in the introduction. I worked there for about 16 years um, and I did research there as part of the Rural Technology Unit. And I taught environmental sciences there. On the right hand side is the building that I used to teach in at Plymouth University, where I spent 15 years teaching environmental education. It took me coming to work for the donkey sanctuary to realise how important working animals are in the realm of sustainability. I had absolutely no idea for 31 years how important they were. When I worked at UEA, that top university, students would come to the Rural Technology Unit and we'd show them irrigation, trickle irrigation programs, we talked to them about pumps, about solar, solar power pumps, tech solutions to problems. We never mentioned animals. I taught 15 years at University of Plymouth in environmental education. We talked about all the different approaches to sustainability. We never mentioned animals. Animals only came onto the agenda, only came onto the radar when we started working with those low impact communities. How, how on earth has that happened? How can I have worked for over 30 years in this field and not realized how important animals are to sustainable development? And it wasn't just me. I can guarantee that none of my colleagues knew either. People at the university now are really surprised when I talk to them about it. How has that come about? How do, I, how, how do I not know about this? Right? And unfortunately, my, my, my answer to that question is that I blame you. <laughs> it's, all, it's all your fault because <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't told me. <laughs> and my final slide really is this. This is uh, Terry Pratchett, some of you might know. He's an English, was an English author. He died a few years ago. There's this nice quote about even if it's not your fault, it's your responsibility. And I think part of the problem with working animals and, uh, is that it's, it's too siloed. What I would really implore you, really ask you to do in future, if you write a paper, don't publish it in a specialist journal. Submit it to a geography journal, submit it to a development studies journal, put it into an education journal, put it somewhere beyond the, the, the area of, of, of working equids. Likewise with conferences, By all means go to conferences on working equids, that's really important for, for, for updating yourselves, but attend other conferences, go to geography conferences, present papers there. Right. You need, you really do need to get the, the message out there because no one's listening. No, one, no one's hearing you. We, 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 we're learning loads. We're learning lots and lots and lots about stuff, but we're not listening. And, and you, you are so, so important in the sustainability agenda. I've really come to realise in the last couple of years how, how important working equities and how important working animals are 
particularly in low income countries. And it's a message which has got, if you excuse the pun, will have real, real traction and can make a really significant difference. But the message really has to be out there. So that's been a really long, weavy journey. If you've understood about 10% of it, you've done better than I have. Um, I, hope you, I hope you got something out of that, uh, even if it was just a bit of a rest. <laughs> and uh, just to go back to my original point, um, both from the University of Plymouth and from the Donkey Sanctuary, thanks very much for listening. Is that it? Thanks, Roger. It's nice when it's getting dark. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh... Can I please ask you to stop sharing uh, the screen? There we go. And maybe the next thing I'll do is I will ask people to ask you some questions. I can see there are some comments here. First of all, I really like to thank you because it's, it's, I told you this afternoon, there is going to be a good journey and there is for sure a good journey. There's a lot of reflection there. There's a lot of points. Uh, I do have some comments and some questions, but I'd like first to open this to, to the audience. So please feel free to ask. If you agree or disagree with Roger, that's that's also part of the. <laughs> yeah. Please go for it. You you can either I'm use the chat or you can just uh, unmute yourselves and ask Roger. Well, I think I'm going to break the ice first, Roger. There okay. is I don't know if you know, but there is a there is a. a an Australian author, uh, Reggie Fuller from Deakin University in Australia. This person wrote a, a fantastic paper in 2012 and the title is Human and Animal uh, Renewables, uh, Human and Animal Energy, The Forgotten Renewables. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic title because it's all about sustainability, it's all about renewable. And at the end, human power is actually the most incredible renewable source of energy and if you then if you if you manage to bring animals into the equation yeah. it's 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 absolutely incredible if you bring human power and animal power we're probably talking about 75 to 80 percent of the total power that rural workers in the world use nowadays yeah. which yeah. is which is quite incredible so the, the reason Pete, Pete Slester from Factu he has a, a very interesting point that says that they are not storable you cannot mass produce them yeah. And they are not really available when you want to use them, especially in, in, in urban areas. So, and that he thinks is one of the reasons, or uh, maybe some reasons why people tend to move, sorry, tend to move away from physical efforts and things that show you when they are linked to poverty, people try to, to tend to move away from that. So mm -hmm. is that part of the process? Try to show that there's nothing bad if you, yeah. if you want to do manual work and work with animals? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's really important. I think I think it is part of the process. I think one of the things it, one of the things when we talk and think about a, a future sustainable world is that people always fall for fall into the production side of things. It's how do we produce electricity? You know, how do we how do we produce this? How do we produce that? Um, and that's what, what I said when, with, with the pictures that the students used to draw of, of, of what a sustainable community looks like. It would always have. They'd always have wind. They'd always have um, uh, uh, wind, uh, wind turbines. It would all be about electrical power. You know, how are we going to how are we going to get electrical power? And in fact, actually, when you lower your consumption, you you you, you can you can rely on on different sorts of power. And and, and animal power, as I said, is is, is a really, really important one because as as, that, as the guy that wrote that paper has pointed out, you don't just get the power of the animal. You get all the other additional aspects like uh, you know it doesn't poach the soil you've got the manure to to to, to reuse and to, re, to use as fertilizer um it provides you with a with a, with a different sort of focus or all, all, all manner of things so you, it, close, really, you close the cycle right yeah you close, you close the cycle it, 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 it's a cyclical production and 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 that is is and, and, and of course you know it's you know, essentially carbon neutral as well so you've got a, it's a really it's a real positive and it's, and it's about one of the few ways, if you really wanted to go back to one world, if, if, if we're going to look at, you know, greater sustainability, I'm not saying that everyone's got to live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, in a hut in a wood. Um, that, that's, you know, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. And it's not what the people in those communities suggest, but we, we need to spread our, our energy requirements. We look, we need to look at all ways of, of, of doing things and, 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 and keep the, and, and keep the door wide open, you know, 
let, let's let's think of as many different ways of of, of, of living and, a, and a different different ways of, of creating energy and movement than just using baseload electricity all the time you know from central from centralized power sources especially because it's 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 like a a lie saying that energy uh, electricity is a clean energy when we know the impact that a big dam yeah. may have in a in a river right yeah, well, yeah i mean that's that's one of the problems with anything you know with with greenwashing isn't it? it's like electric cars yep. i mean gov governments are, are consistently saying you know that oh we're, we're all we're doing away with diesel and petrol engines um by 2030 or whatever um but actually if you look at the carbon balance from from raw material to to scrap the, the, the carbon emissions during the lifetime of the car are only a small part of the total carbon emissions yep. of construction. Yep. When you look but, to life cycle analysis, the reality yep. is completely different. Yeah. No, no one does the maths. That's, that's one of the big problems with sustainability. No, no one sits down and does the mathematics. Yep. Uh, Alex wrote a comment here. Say, hey, Roger, one problem I always feel uh, with trying to live like this community is that the backup of good healthcare for humans and animals has to rely on very modern technology. Whether there is contraception to reduce population growth, vaccines for us and for like France, or human euthanasia, or humane euthanasia, sorry. I am not sure we can go back or forward without the knowledge this. No, I, th I think that's absolutely right, uh, uh, Alex. And I think yeah, th those, those, those four communities that we work with on that research project are. Of rural communities and you know i don't think i think we're beyond the the schumacher idea of decentralized low-tech piles now for everybody i think the real challenge in the future is how we how we have sustainable cities and how we maintain the technology particularly the medical technology as you say how we how we maintain those um but i think again i think the only the only way i can see forward is for a range of different different ways of living you know accepting different different patterns and different ways of of, 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 of people existing um uh, you know uh, uh, say in, in the united kingdom for example um it's really important that we have those technologies you know i'm not i'm not, I'm not at all suggesting at any time and, and neither are the people who live in those communities that we're going to go back to the middle ages or we're going to go back to some pre-industrial um <coughs> world um we couldn't do that anyway i don't think it's i don't think it's physically possible to do that I mean, we wouldn't want to do that we, we enjoy fantastic levels of life expectancy and health. We, it's never, there's never been a better time to be alive, ironically. Um, so I think we, 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 we do need to maintain that. But I think at the same time, we can't, we can't just see the future as exactly as we are now, but somehow magically sustainable. We need to really think very carefully about how we can, how we can um, manage that, that transition and, and be far more accepting, I think, of, of and, and cosmopolitan in the way that people live their lives. At the moment, um, certainly in the, in the UK, it seems to me that you go to school, you go to college, you go to university, you get a job, and any deviation from that is, is, is almost seen as, as some de degree of deviation. You know, it's, it's, it's unusual. Um, and I think we, we, we do need as a society to be mu much more accepting and much more kind of inventive in the way that we live. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure at all if that's answered your question, Alex, but uh, I'm going to assume it has. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Any other question to Roger or comments? We have people from different parts of the world. Is, is this reality that Roger told us here applicable to your regions or? I just thought I just thought they were quite interesting examples for you to think about. Um, in terms of as I said, these these young people in particular, these these four communities, they are unique, but they are you know they are in a in a in a, in a high income country, and they're kind of trying. There's, there's lots of criticisms that you could level at them. You know, like we couldn't all live like that. They 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 use the trappings of of an unsustainable world. You know, like the stage from Glastonbury and things like that. Um, you know, but but at least they're trying. You know, they're, they're trying to do something different and, and, they're, and they're learning loads. They really are. It's a rich source of learning. And how is the general public opinion about these communities? Because somehow what you're telling us here is these people, they are just thinking out of the box. They are not reinventing the wheel. They are just taking, as you said, coming one step 
done yeah. in terms of technology. Uh, I think they will be happy to know that the Amish community already developed a huge amount of technology to make all those machinery work with horses, so they don't need the steam engine. <laughs> I think they will, be, they will be happy to know that. <laughs> Frightening as hell, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, nowadays with all this social media, with, 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 with this world, people is more afraid than ever what others may think, you know, in public opinion. So yeah. is that a factor that is making people not going back to what they want to do or? It's pretty, it's pretty hard living like that. I mean, I, 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 I was in and out of those communities during the, during the research project and staying over. Um, it's, it's quite a tough life. But I mean, one of the things that, that they all do, um, particularly the Stewards Wood community, the one with the, the stage from Glastonbury, that lot, the ones that take the horse to the pub, they've made a massive effort to get on with their neighbors and to, and to go into the village. You know, they have a quiz team in, in the local pub. They take the horse down and give kids rides. They, they take part in all the community events, you know, and, and they've really tried to dissolve the barrier between any, any kind of barrier between them and the local community. They've, they've made a really, really big effort to do that. And that's that's a very, very important part of these communities. They they get on very well as a group of individuals. Um, they, they run by what's called consensus management. There's no there's no management committee, but they also go to great go to great lengths to make friends with local with with the local community you know with the uh the sort of um yeah the the uh, i suppose the high you know the, the high usage community as opposed to the low your low usage community because it's really it's really important for them that they don't that they're not seen as being something bad or something poor stacy's just wrote a comment here i think uh, she said, but I think we'll see more and more communities living like this. There are already many, but I'll continue to be very varied based on region. Yeah, yeah we, I'm sure they will be. They're, 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 they're very varied in the UK, and, and, they're, and they're all they're all really different. I mean, Findhorn in Scotland, um, that's a commu that's a that's a sort of a, a town now. If you, if you look up Findhorn online, you'll see pictures of what you know turfed buildings and really high they've gone to a very high tech end of sustainability um, so there's there's lots of different types some some a little more than um, than teepees there's a famous uh, famous community in South Wales called Bryn Mawr which is known as the, which is known as teepee town because they the, the people there just live in teepees and that's been there for 30 40 years now so there is, a lot of, there is a lot of variation yeah Sorry, I just I jump one comment because the first that was the second part of the comment. So let me just sorry, Stacey, about that. The first part was there is so much variation from state to state within the US alone. Politics, religion, state wealth, progressive mind, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It would be very challenging here, and then I'll jump to the second part. But I think we'll see more and more communities living like these. There are already many, but it will continue to be a very varied based on region. That was the yeah. sorry, Stacey, that was the, the full I, comment. I agree, I, I agree entirely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, I, think we do, I think I think I think young people in particular. If you look at the the Occupy movement, if you look at Extinction Rebellion, if you look at the concerns that young people have, and the increasing pressure, I think that, that the high income world is is putting on young people, it wouldn't I wouldn't be at all surprised if more and more people just moved into a different type of living. Really. Yep. Tamara raised her hand. Tamara, go for it, please. Hi, Roger. Thank you for your talk. Very inspiring. I was thinking that in Chile you still see a lot of communities that live like this, but not because they're going like one step backwards, but because they they are poor communities, so they don't have another option. So maybe they're not thinking about sustainability, but they probably are more sustainable than than we living in, in the city. And they use horses to move around, to take their their produce to the markets. But how how can we I, how can we convince the government that they don't need to construct like buildings to put these people in, and that maybe what we need to do is improve these areas so they can have some basic services, but not force them into this urban uh, type of system living. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to because in, in I, and I think it happens in most Latin American countries that we, we still have a lot of communities that live like this, but not because they want. 
Yeah. And the other thing that caught my attention was in your first slide about happiness and income. Uh, we, we actually measured um, the perception of the quality of life of this, these communities. And these horse owners perceive their quality of life as very good. And they are living below the, the poverty level. And when we were um, doing the pilot of the study, I did it with some colleagues, and everyone scored uh, lower in the quality of life assessment, even though they had well, higher incomes and they have been through university and they have postgraduate degrees. So it does seem that uh, when you have more, you also want more, and, and you have this different type of I don't know, aspirations about life. And when you have less, you learn kind of how to live with less and to live in community and to share and other aspects of life. So I thought that it's really interesting to see that that happens everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that really is interesting, isn't it? I mean, my, my, my friend Robert, who works in Ladakh in, in India, that's what his research project was about. Um, he was really interested in these these that there is nothing more sustainable than traditional communities because they've lived like they've lived like that for, for hundreds of years and and, and 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 robert was really concerned about um kind of i don't know west western concepts of sustainability being being dropped into these traditional communities and he was he was really arguing in the same way that we were when, when i was working with those low impact communities rob was talking about his his papers that that he produced sub subsequently is about what, what we can learn from traditional societies and, tra and, tra and traditional communities rather than the other way around. And one of his conclusions, as you, as you say, was that idea that, you know, we, 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 we export lots of stuff, you know, we manufacture cars and we export produce, but one of the, one of the most dangerous things that we also export is, is aspiration for those products. You know, that, 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 that young people aspire to consume lots um, and and, and, we, and, we, and we kind of try, we, we sell that as as advancement as you know you can improve yourself if you if you if you spend more on on, on consumer goods, um, which and of course as as your as your research has shown that's not necessarily the case. You know, so so I think it's really it's really quite intriguing. But but one of the things going back to what you were saying about those 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 traditional communities or those those those, those people in those, those poorer communities. Um, you know, I, I'm very much of the I'm very much of the opinion that 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 you know, a bit like Murray Bookchin, really, that the world isn't being destroyed by poor people. You know, it's it's not being destroyed by poverty. It's being it's being destroyed by it's being destroyed by the wealthy. You know, it's it's the top. If you look at the top twenty companies of the, you know, the worst polluting companies, eight of them have got CEOs who are Harvard graduate business school graduates. You know, got MBAs in in, in management. Um, so. I don't think that the sustainability agenda is necessarily an issue um, that, that, that the poorest communities in the world can do much about because they're disempowered. I think the, the, the major steps forward are going to have to be in the high income countries. You know, and, and what we can learn from uh, those communities is going to be really, really important. And we talk about resilience. You know, if we're going to look for the resilience, then what more resilience can you expect than, than a traditional community? Because they've lived like that, as I said, for hundreds of years. So it's just, I think I think there's a lot we have to learn. I mean, in other words, going back to the title of the presentation, there's a lot there's a lot we have to listen to. Roger, when when Tamara was now saying what she just said, mm -hmm. it took me to that uh, circle where you have all the countries uh, yeah. where where UK was performing better than Portugal by three days. That one, remember? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And we're that, funny, we're in that green. <laughs> Chile was in between Portugal and the UK. I think that's only that's because you have more public holidays, so you work less. So in those days, you you pollute less. <laughs> but the, the the funny thing is, when you see these countries in Latin America, where, with massive cities like Mexico City or whatever, these these huge uh, metropolitan areas, but on the other side of the coin, you have truly rural world. You go to Mexico, and as soon as you leave. Uh, Mexico City and the state of Mexico, yeah, that yeah. you actually enter in in the rural in the rural world, and in those worlds, exactly as you said, there is this truly resilience. So, 
is that do we need to make a differentiation be between those countries who still have rural heritage and rural communities alive and those who actually move from having rural side and are now more than more urban than they used to be and they lost this link is that possible i think I, i'd like to think it would be i mean i think the, i think the greatest challenge in the future is how is how we we don't build rural communities you know because we've got a model for that you know we've, we've got we've got villages and we've got small towns and we've got you know we've got small communities in rural areas already i think the single biggest challenge in the future is how we build sustainable cities you know, how we how we move cities, you know, lar you know large, you know, massive cities like Mexico City, for example, or, or you know, Santiago or London or, or Lisbon into, you know, into a truly sustainable form, you know, and, and, and I don't think it's I don't think that would be impossible. I mean, cities are actually quite green on the face of it because they they have mass transport systems and things like that. But it, that's that's that still remains the, the single biggest challenge, I think. And it's and it, of course, the, the, the problem we have today is that. Um, when Schumacher was around and writing, you know, small is beautiful and talking about low tech decentralized um, um, societies, there were half there were half the people in the world. I mean, the, the population of the planet is, is more than doubled in, in, in my lifetime. Yeah. Stacy. You are on mute, Stacy. There you go. I know. Sorry, I'm trying to get my video back to you because I I feel like it's not nice when you can't see the person. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was you. I basically you said you just touched on what I was going to ask or or just pose because I I think the urbanization question is huge. Like the population is supposed to be nine billion, isn't it? By 2050, to almost 10 yeah. billion people. So yeah, so not everyone's going to be able to live like like this. And so then you know, really trying to green up cities and. I think the only plus side to having so many people in such a huge population density is that you can enact policy that's going to have a huge impact on many people, you know, at one time, but, you know, you have to make huge changes in the transportation sector and the energy sector, you know, to try to, to try to do that. I, I just don't know how we're going to do it. I, 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 I don't see much, much progress in that either beyond, beyond sort of, um, you know, uh, piecemeal, piecemeal policies about, um, about, you know, um, air pollution, and, yeah. you know, ban banning cars from city centres and, and, and putting more money into transport systems, which is just a, a, dro a drop in the ocean. I think, I think the two really, the two really big things that we're going to have to um, look, to look for for the future are sustainable cities. Um, I think, you know, working animals might have a role to play there. But I think the other thing, the other elephant in the room, no one's talk, no one talks much about, are the, are, are the carbon emissions from agriculture. You know, it was a third of, of, of atmospheric carbon, you know, um, uh, a third of greenhouse gases um, are emitted through through agriculture. And there's very little we can do about that because that's 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 our food. So uh, addressing low carbon agriculture um, is, is also a really significant challenge. And, and there you might find there's, there's, a, there's a greater role for working animals. But it's but you know, whether you're going to feed the world, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, with a low carbon approach is going to be really it's going to be really difficult yeah because animals fit in a specific production model you know you cannot expect to manage a 2000 x farm of cereals in australia pulled by horses you, yeah, you, you can't do it yeah. you know so i think you know i think we need to present the working animals as a, a powerful tool after you decide to 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 to, to 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 follow a path, if your path is to go down and to keep your small farm and have your production, then working animals can be a very powerful tool for you. You know, it's it's. I think it's it's part of our job. The same way Roger was saying that we need to go to different areas of study, go to to different conferences to to spread the word. I think we need to present working animals as a very powerful tool if we decide to take a certain path. If you decide to go the other way, there's nothing. It's a little bit like when we talk about uh, sustainable forest management. If the idea is to cut an entire forest, there's no, there's no room for animals. You just bring the big machinery and you finish first. You know? But when you're going to cut all the trees, you're not counting on the soil, you're not counting on the environment, the local species, uh, nothing. So it's, it's, I think we need to make the decision first. And when that decision is a more green one, a more sustainable one to use again the world, is then when it can be, well, we have a solution that may be useful for you. I think that's the way to to do things. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't disagree. I mean, it's, there are some huge problems in the future. 
and, and, and you as an organization, I think do have a really important role in terms of promoting the uh, promoting the, um, the, the 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 concept or the ideas around around working animals, um, because it 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 remains, you know, it, it's certainly an option for certain communities in the future, but it remains, in in my opinion at least, and in, in my in my professional circles in the in the university sector, particularly in development studies in geography, it 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 remains an unknown it remains an unknown factor. You know, I, I've been to endless conferences uh, over the last few years to talk about um, to talk about working animals and their importance, particularly in countries. That, you know, and, and people have never heard of it, never never come across it. And I and I was one of those people. I, I, when I worked at uh, when I worked in Norwich, when I worked at the University of East Anglia, we used to work in Ken we, we worked in northern Kenya. Every year we'd go out to northern Kenya. We worked in Ethiopia. We worked at Mekelele University in northern Ethiopia, and we were completely oblivious. We were blind to it. It's it's taken me meeting you as a, as, a, as a group of people for me to realize the importance of working animals for so many communities. So I think you, you do have a really important function, a really, really important role to, to get out there and, and, and to push this message. So that's not, not too much for you to ask really, just it's, it's, it's down to you to save the world. I've had my time, I, I, I failed miserably. Things have got progressively worse. Um, so, so it's over to you now. Is that why you're getting retired? <laughs> I'm retiring to, to uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm retiring next week, if, if, you, don't, if you didn't know. <laughs> Four days and counting, right, Roger? <laughs> Four, days. Four more days. <laughs> so, pa Paolo just wrote a comment to say, uh, each one can make the difference, it's a long and hard path. And I think it's, this is not being pessimistic, it's just being realistic, I, I think, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a terribly, it's, it's, it's going to be a terribly difficult path, yeah, yeah. But it's one that it's one that we we've been talking about for 45 50 years um you know we've known we've known for a long long time i think if, if anything our, our children and our, and, our, and our children's children will look back at us as a generation and think why didn't they do anything you know, they knew what was happening they had all the data they know what's going on but they did so little and we spent so much time talking about stuff which is why i admire those people in those communities actually those those low impact communities because we spend so much time talking about stuff and, and, and not very much time doing things. And they've actually, young people in particular now, seem to be really engaging with it and actually, you know, and actually trying to live in different ways and trying to take things on. Oh, that's, that's a hard part, but there's hope, right? <laughs> well, we're nothing without hope, Joel. <laughs> I don't know if there is any final question for Roger. No, no, I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> There's a final comment from, from Stacy. She she just left and said, Are you running off to Tinker's bubble for the retirement, Roger? See you soon. <laughs> so maybe that's an option, Roger, for you to think about it. <laughs> it's far too hard. I'm just gonna buy a gas guzzler and have a party. There we go. <laughs> we can give you a donkey and you can work with them with your donkey. <laughs> Roger, once again, thank you so much for your well, time. It was it was lovely to have you with us. Uh, for those who, who join us, thank you so much for coming. I uh, just would like to remind you that the fact you has a YouTube channel, so all the webinars we, we recorded in the past and this one uh, are, will be available soon. Uh, and we'll announce the next webinar in, well, I can announce now that the next two webinars that fact will organize are going to be in French. Uh, the, the next one is the 14th of April and another one on the 17th of May. Basically with the French people, we are doing something really interesting. We brought four specialists who know or five specialists actually that they 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 are used to educate horses. So it's pretty much the same questionnaire as a, as an interview, and we are having five different visions of how to get horses into work. Some of them for agriculture, some of them for logging. We will try our best to get those webinars translated. They will be subtitled in in different languages. Uh, of course, uh, on on in the fact we do it as a, as a pro bono, so it may take a while but eventually it will happen, but at least you'll have the original ones and this one will be available in English soon. Thank you so much for your time. Roger, once again, thank you so much for, for accepting this, this invitation. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.